uh, for as an undergraduate uh, and um, received her law degree from Widener University. After that, she practiced uh, law in both Philadelphia and in Glenside for a brief period. Um, about the time she was raising her three sons, she and her husband, uh, she and her husband were raising three sons, her husband's uh, uh, PJ, um, she decided on a career choice, um, a career change, and became a member of the faculty over at, um, uh, in the English department at LaSalle. Now, she taught uh, composition, persuasive writing, rhetoric, and very important, uh, importantly in terms of this context, uh, ethics. Okay. Um, she has, uh, she's been a contributor to the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, Daily News, and Patriot News. Um, returning to public service after she graduated from Fells uh, School, the Fells School at University of Pennsylvania, she ran and was elected uh, Abington Commissioner, Abington, Pennsylvania Commissioner. She was elected to the Pennsylvania State House in 2012. That was a, um, a special election um, uh, after um, uh, the predecessor who is predecessor to the, in that seat, who is now the attorney general uh, in Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, uh, was elected commissioner in uh, Montgomery County um, with me, by the way, as register of wills. Um, uh, Congresswoman, uh, Dean has been an advocate uh, in her elected position uh, for education, healthcare access, environmental protection, criminal justice reform, combating addiction, and ending gun violence. Specifically, after Sandy Hook, she helped form and she was she chaired the uh, Pennsylvania Safe or the PA Safe Caucus in Harrisburg. Now, in 2015, Governor Wolf appointed her to the Pennsylvania Commission on Women. Uh, and in 2018, uh, she ran for Congress in the newly created Pennsylvania 4th. Um, and then she was reelected on uh, in November of 2020. Um, and as a member of the House, She's, uh, she's also a member of, of several caucuses, but she's um, uh, also a met met member of two very important committees, Financial Services Committee and, particularly relevant to the context here, uh, the House Judiciary Committee. After the horrible and outrageous events of uh, January 6th, she was appointed a House impeachment manager and took part in the second Senate trial of the 45th president. Before we begin our discussion, if you don't mind, I'd like to um, quote a couple of tweets from, um, or maybe it was one long tweet from uh, Congresswoman Green, uh, Dean, excuse me. Don't say that. I was in the chamber, I was in the chamber when it was attacked. I know we need healing, but for healing, we need accountability. It is my solemn duty to serve as an impeachment manager. As we begin the trial, we must be guided by facts and the experience we all witnessed. I think that's a very interesting lead up into our um, conversation this evening. Professor Lane. Thank you so much, Bruce, for that great introduction of the Congresswoman. I was gonna start with the impeachment first and go into the insurrection because that quote was so meaningful that I'm gonna flip it a little bit, because I know that what happened on January 6th gave a lot of impetus to what happened. Um, Congresswoman, um, were you at the Capitol that day? Unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you. Number one, thank you, uh, Professor Lane, Professor Haynes, uh, for inviting me tonight. Um, when D. Bruce called me, texted me, however we communicated this invitation, uh, I was so pleased to be able to join you. I am a former professor. So to be here with you, uh, with the Arlen Specter Center, Thomas Jefferson University, uh, it's just an absolute uh, honor and privilege. And I, I look forward to give and take and learning from all of you in the room. Uh, the answer is yes, I was there on January 6th. 
Uh, I was excited to be there. Uh, I, I knew that for the first time as a member of Congress, I was going to participate uh, in this important constitutional day, the certification of electors uh, for the, for the uh, election of the president. So yes, I was there. I literally had asked my staff to stay home. Uh, not that I have many staff in the Capitol as a result of the pandemic, but I was there. I was actually in the gallery at the point of the insurrection. I'm gonna read a quote from the former guy. And this is what he said recently. Even though those individuals of people that were marching the Capitol were trying to pressure people like me to vote the way they wanted me to vote, I knew these people that love this country, that truly respect law enforcement, would never do anything to break the law. So I wasn't concerned. I'm sorry, this is from Johnson. And now that had the tables been turned, uh, and this could get me into trouble, had the tables been turned and President Trump won the election, and those were tens of thousands of Black Lives Matter and Antifa uh, protesters, I might have been a little concerned. Um, you were there that day. Uh, I'd like to have you uh, respond to that quote from Senator Johnson, if you can. It's obscene. I, I don't understand it. Uh, I'll, I'll paint the picture just a teeny bit of where I was and what I experienced. And what I experienced was what Democrats, Republicans, staffers, administration experienced. Uh, the insurrectionists were not taking names and trying to figure out who had a, a Democratic pin or who had a Republican pin. Uh, we were all members of Congress. And sadly, we were warned to take our pins off. Imagine that. The, the, the shame of that we get to have this extraordinary opportunity to serve uh, and against Americans attacking Americans, we needed to hide who we were, shameful. So Johnson's uh, references, I don't understand. They make no sense. They are illogical, especially if you were there, uh, but they also reveal uh, racism. That You just have to see it for what it is. Um, I was there, it was January the 6th, I was preparing my remarks because Pennsylvania, you know, was among the states that was definitely going to be among the challenges. We knew we'd be late in the night, uh, but I thought what I'd love to do is go over and see how this works. It's a, after all, it's a joint session of Congress that also included the vice president of the United States, the former guy's own vice president. I don't want that lost on anybody. This wasn't any old field trip day that a group was assembled on the White House or on the ellipse. This was a really important ceremonial constitutional day. So I went over at around one o'clock when the arguments began to hear what it sounded like, the, the arguments in the case of the state of Arizona. I then was talking to Co, I think who is on here and saying, I wanna go back to the office. Nobody was in it, but I wanna go back to the office and finish my remarks for later this evening. As I went back, a, a very tall, Capitol Police officer said, sorry, sorry, ma'am. Uh, you can't go back to Cannon House office building. It is under a bomb threat. Go back to where you were. So I went back up to the gallery. I wasn't able to go on the floor for social distancing purposes. Mm -hmm. So they spread us all out. Uh, and so I was up in the gallery. I remember standing next to Dean Phillips. He's a classmate of mine. We call ourselves the Dean Caucus. Uh, and I was hearing these arguments and he and I, to back and forth said, shame, shame. And then I walked out and I thought, I wonder what's going on outside. I walked over to a darkened uh, open office and peered out at the top of the Capitol and could see on the side I was on some uh, protesters gathering, but it didn't look threatening. I got back inside and very quickly, we heard a series of ad hoc announcements from the floor, please be seated. Uh, and we thought, well, why, why do we have to be seated? Um, then right after that, please prepare to kneel or lie down on the floor. With that, I moved down to the front row of uh, the gallery, thinking that front row, that wall would be a shield. I didn't know what I was shielding myself from, but uh, so after that, we then were told to take out our gas masks. I didn't know we had gas if masks. If I could stop you one second, because you're saying so much. What were you thinking, this is where you work, this is the capital of the United States of America, and you were told to go down on the floor? I mean, what were you thinking at that moment? I, I was in breathless disbelief. And I, 
and I remember I, I talked to staff and I talked to my fa a couple of family members. I said, this is absurd. We're, we've been warned to get down on the floor. What does that mean? Where, where are, uh, what's, where's the trouble? We thought this was the most secure place. I have to admit at that moment, we looked up to the gallery doors and we knows, noticed many of them were unmanned. So we thought, you know what? Somebody could be breaking into any one of those multiple gallery doors, uh, not to mention the doors of the floor. So at first, Evan, my, my instinct was this is madness, but I will drop down. Mm -hmm. When they said, take out your gas masks, I, I didn't know we had gas masks. They warned us they were under the seat. Uh, mm -hmm. Strangely, they are cellophane wrapped three times. Uh, we had no warning of how to do this. <laughs> They're all helping each other unwrap them. Um, I remember looking over uh, and uh, Veronica Escobar, one of my classmates, was wearing a beautiful white jacket. And I'm down and I'm hollering to people to get down. And I could see that in the line of sight, it, it's like a shooting gallery, that she was going to be it, such an obvious target. So I'm screaming at her. She's trying to put on her gas mask, get down, get down. I'm calling Lucille Roybal Allard next to me, come over here, trying to undo the gas masks. And then they said, put on your gas masks. They have pierced, they are as close as the rotunda. They have sprayed tear gas, wait for further instructions on how we will get you out of here. At that point, were you fearing for your life? The, re the, the moment I thought I was truly in danger was when I heard, it still gets me. Uh, I kept thinking, come on, this is a chamber. Uh, uh, but when I heard the pounding on the doors, those doors that if you've watched any movie that involves, or if you watched uh, the president give a State of the Union, he or she walks through those gorgeous ceremonial doors. Uh, when I heard the pounding on the doors and the piercing of that glass, I thought we are in trouble. Oh my God. The thing I've been thinking about is the Republicans, Democrats, were there Republicans and Democrats, or were you just a bunch of scared people at that point? We weren't Republicans. We weren't Republicans. Hustled out of there. Uh, I, I didn't care whether I was running next to a Republican or a Democrat. Um, gas masks on. We were hustled in a very um, unplanned way. Uh, first over to Rayburn Cafeteria, which was an absurdity. But we were running in those corridors, those underground tunnels, uh, as a mass of people. Also in the grouping with me were journalists. Um, I remember when we got to the Rayburn cafeteria, which we all said is an absurdity, this floor to ceiling glass, this is nuts. Uh, somebody at the door said, members only, members only. I said, well, where are staff supposed to go? Where, why, you got to close the door on them? It was nuts. So uh, we weren't Republicans. We weren't Democrats. We were then moved to a more secure location, and we were all together. And then there, there was an apparency of, of uh, sometimes you could see party in that room, which was sad. Really? Tell me about May, it. Let me, let me break in here. Go ahead. At Jeff. what time, at what time uh, did you get the news that you were going to reconvene? And how did, how did that news make you feel? Do you want to do it, or were you glad that um, you were going to overcome this? Thank you for that question. And I want to tell you, when we all got into what now is known, we were in the Ways and Means room, but we were literally warned, do not, you know, you're talking to your family members, don't tell them where you are, tell them you are safe. We don't want the press to know, we don't want, obviously, the insurrectionists to know where you are. Uh, and very, very quickly, uh, Bruce, Hakeem Jeffries, Next to Liz Cheney, almost shoulder to shoulder, stood at the front of that room, put microphones up at the hearing desks and said, you know, what they knew, which was very limited at that time. And we had no TVs, by the way. So 200 plus people are in this room. We have no idea the magnitude of what is going on outside. But they both said the same thing. Uh, we will, you know, we'll be sure to be kept safe. Uh, we will do this together and we will go back to the floor and complete our constitutional duty. Hakeem Jeffrey said it as our caucus chair, Liz Cheney said it as their conference chair. Uh, so that to me sent the absolute right tone. We are not gonna be deterred, uh, even by an insurrection, a deadly 
horrifying, terrifying insurrection. So I was delighted. I want to get back to the former guy for a second, what he recently said. He said it was a zero threat right from the start. Some of them went in and they were hugging and kissing the police and guards. What is your response to that? Shameful. I know so many of the police there. I know them better now. Uh, I've respected them always, but the former guy knows the truth. Our, our impeachment trial revealed the truth. Um, the video reveals the truth. We witnessed it. We suffered it. The world watched it. You all saw it. Um, it, it was medieval were, was some of the words that were used. You heard some of that heave ho with no regard for life, no regard for life, torturing, trapping police officers, hoping to get their own weapons to use against them, spraying one with bear spray, killing him. They had no regard for life, whether it was a police officer or it was me or a staffer or a janitorial staff. Uh, there, were, there were a certain serious number of them that were there for absolute mayhem and harm. They, they hung a noose outside the speaker's balcony. They came in chanting, hang Mike Pence. This was a Democrat or Republican. This was an insurrection. Americans attacking Americans incited by the former guy. Which brings us, of course, now to the impeachment. Um, if we can just lay some ground rules, because a lot of people have misconceptions of what impeachment is. If you can tell us um, what's the difference between impeachment and conviction and, um, and what was your role? What exactly is a manager? Well, thanks for asking. And I do want to lay the groundwork that, um, and I've said this to uh, Dee Bruce, uh, being asked to serve as an impeachment manager will probably be the highest honor I'll ever have as an elected official. Just an extraordinary, Just an extraordinary. To be able to play a role, I hope, uh, with professionalism, with integrity, um, with a team of magnificent uh, people, lawyers, uh, better than I'll ever be, um, to put before the American people the truth. So uh, specifically constitutionally, the House had the responsibility uh, to impeach, basically to charge the president. This is not a criminal set of charges. This is constitutional crimes we are talking about here. And you saw that we very rapidly uh, passed a single article of impeachment. We could have come up with a laundry list, as you could imagine, of things that we thought were high crimes and misdemeanors but we chose instead to move quickly because we were coming to the end of the term uh, with the most powerful and potent one, which was inciting an insurrection. And so we passed uh, in the house, the indictment, frankly, of the president on the high crime and misdemeanor of incitement of insurrection. It went over to the Senate. The Senate is the trier of that charge. And we knew uh, that to um, bring it before the Senate and do it uh, with absolute integrity, a belief in conveying the truth, the evidence as it meant the law, the constitution, uh, and uh, putting it before this jury of 100 and a jury who were victims and witnesses in, and we did it in the Senate, which was the very scene of part of the crime. So it was a, an incredible obligation and responsibility. So one is the indictment, one is the trial. And literally at the end, as you all saw, each Senator very uh, solemnly stands and casts a voice vote, guilty or not guilty. So that's, that, that's the role that we played. We put on a trial. Uh, we prepared for it for a couple of weeks. Uh, we did it rather rapidly, but I, I believe very professionally. Uh, we, we worked 
on Zoom call after Zoom call with this team of just dedicated people uh, to make sure we put forward the entire narrative of what took place and the president's responsibility in the incitement, but also importantly, in what he failed to do once the insurrection happened. The failure to bring aid, the failure to send in the National Guard, the failure to simply ask the question, how is my vice president? How are all of you? I think he, from what I heard, and I'm interested of course in what you've heard, that he was enjoying watching this occur on his television inside the White House. Um, is, is that some, is that rumor or is that um, something that's factual? I believe that is factual. It was corroborated by several persons who said he was puzzled why others within the West Wing weren't seeing this as uh, something to watch, something good. Uh, clearly um, an abandonment of his oath of office, an extraordinary, grotesque abandonment of his oath of office uh, to protect and defend us, to protect and defend the Constitution. And, and read, go, go ahead. I want to read something that you said. I think this is a good time for it. When you let off as manager and you said, it is for the sake of our country, not the hate of one man or anyone, but for the love of our country and constitution. The case is clear. It is our solemn duty to impeach Donald Trump. This tragedy must have consequences. Um, can you explain what you meant by that? Well, uh, Evan, Professor, I. I have been misunderstood and I think others have been misunderstood as somehow hating the former guy. You know, I, I, you both described, I have served on judiciary. I desperately wanted to be on judiciary for all reasons, all kinds of reasons. I didn't expect two impeachments, frankly. But I, I have not operated out of hate for a single person at all. And that might sound like poppycock to some people, but it's just not, it's just, it is the truth. Uh, what I feel is a passion for our country, a passion to protect our precious constitution. I think the former guy never read the constitution, never cared about it, never swore his oath because he believed in the precious words and the structure of it and that we need to uphold it because it is precious. And if we don't, it, it can be shattered. It is not a guarantee. So I operated uh, out of a passion for our democracy and protection of our constitution. Uh, and I, I, I think so often, it just keeps running through my head uh, what Martin Luther King said, which, and I'm gonna blunder it a little, but he said, I prefer the path of love because hate is just too great a burden to bear. That's the way I feel. You ever have that kind of a burden of hatred for somebody? It's more a burden on us than it is on them. So reject the burden of hate, figure out where you can operate out of love, love of country, democracy, your colleagues, your coworkers, your, your students. Uh, that's a better driver. So I didn't operate uh, out of hate. I operated out of it. And, and I think you saw that among all nine of us, an extraordinary feeling of purpose. That was it. I wanna look, go ahead, Bruce, go ahead. It's a question uh, with regard to um, your, your thinking about success. Now, we can agree now, and, and I know some people who are not as familiar with the procedure as you've described it will say, oh, he was not impeached. No, he was impeached. He's been impeached twice, and he was tried twice. He just wasn't convicted two times. Okay, I think we can be clear on that. Was it your thinking that somehow in the development or the writing of these, um, of the, uh, and the, the last impeachment, the article of impeachment, the single article, that you would be able to convince, um, what did you need, 17 uh, Republicans to join uh, for two thirds or, or not? What was your thinking with regard to the, the facts of the goal, not the aspirations of the goal, but the, the facts on the ground with regard to whether or not you could convince additional um, uh, senators to go along with you. Uh, I think you know me well enough uh, to know we were going for 100. 
We literally were. Because we know the facts and the law convicted him. We absolutely knew that. Uh, and so I remember with Jamie Raskin early on, people doing the math on our, we had Zoom calls just like this every single day for an hour and a half or two hours in our preparations and as we were writing and putting scripts together and figuring out the clips and all that kind of stuff. And I remember talking through strategy and people were doing the math and, and Jamie Raskin and I were both of the mind that, okay, I know constitutionally we need 67. So you're all talking about where are our 17, but we want to put forward a case that will convince the American people 100% of the guilt of the high crime and misdemeanor by a president of the United States. Let's remember, he did this in the waning days of his presidency by not convicting him uh, as Jamie Raskin came up with the January exception. You have to uphold your oath of office every single day, except January, you know? A couple of weeks before, I can go on a crime spree because <laughs> they're not going to be able to get 67 people to convict once I'm out of office. Uh, it's an absurdity. We all know it. So, Bruce, I might be a little naive, but I was a person going for 100. Failing the 100, I will say I, we, we did hope for the 67, the constitutional requirement. Failing that. Guess what my takeaway is? The president was convicted. We didn't meet. We, we got a majority and we got a substantial right. majority. 57 was a serious majority. I guess the first impeachment was 51. We, was it Mitt Romney was the one. Mm -hmm. um, so we got 57. We had seven, including our own Senator Toomey uh, and Senator Burr and, and others who saw it with clarity and conscience. We didn't need more clearly, facts. Clear, clearly, we, was a victory. We, absolutely, it was a victory for the good guys. It clearly was. A majority of the Senate convicted this president, and to your point, he stands forever impeached twice. And this was a bipartisan impeachment, so we'll we'll take those historical victories. Representative, um, I want to talk about the facts and what actually happened because there's so much smoke out there purposely put out. Um, there are several different things. There's of course the speech that day, but as you clearly put out in your presentation, that speech wasn't it, it was part of it. And there's a lot that went into it. So, and also what happened regarding his calls to Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. So I'd like to just break that down a little bit. Um, regarding his calls, and his to Michigan and, and Pennsylvania and so forth. What did he do and how is it improper? And how did you pursue that as evidence? You saw in the impeachment trial, we literally broke it into chapters. So one of the chapters that I had was his speech. Another chapter that I had prior to that were the court cases and some of the calls. And so uh, number one, um, you saw this was a pattern of behavior. You're right. It wasn't a single day, January 6th, several hour speech, including, uh, you know, 67 minutes or whatever it was by the president. Um, this was a sustained program of disinformation that led to incitement to violence. Uh, and so the disinformation began early last year in the campaign cycle where the president, when asked, would he accept the results of the election? He wasn't sure um, that um, if he lost, it might, might necessarily be the result of um, some foul play, some wrongdoing, some theft. Um, he was aided and abetted by his attorney general who said there is likely going to be massive fraud because of mail-in ballots. Let's remember what mail-in ballots are. They're legally cast votes by legal voters. Uh, and there was all kinds of hanky-panky across the entire country in legislatures, uh, in, in um, departments of state, but there were also some extraordinary people. So uh, we had the lead up to the election, sowing seeds of doubt, saying this election is going to be stolen, mail-in ballots are a massive fraud. You saw the bigotry that was laced into that 
the, the idea that certain people's votes should not count, be counted. And we're now seeing, sadly, a legacy, a continuation of that. Um, but what we tried to show were the facts. Legislatures approve these things. Pennsylvania's Republican-led legislature updated our election laws to include no excuse mail-in ballots. Once the election took place, you saw Republican legislatures tried to block the pre-counting of votes or the pre-opening of votes. So there would be this appearance of a win by a Republican because tens of thousands of votes had not yet been opened who had been mailed in and legally cast. Uh, that red mirage, I guess they called it. Uh, and then the campaign with the courts. And none of the courts found Republican judges Trump appointed judges, other Republican appointed judges, democratically appointed judges, none of them found uh, any massive fraud. Ultimately, his own attorney general had to say, yeah, you're right. This is of course on his way out the door uh, when the damage was done. Uh, yeah, you're right. There was no material voter fraud. Um, and so there, it, it was the sowing and the continuation of the big lie, which sadly continues to this day. Uh, and let's not forget the tweet I'll see you there January 6th. It's gonna be wild. Let's, uh, that, I don't understand how anyone gets around that one. It's going to be wild. Uh, and they knew who was in the audience. Uh, they knew from social media, the Proud Boys and the others who were there and their, uh, their incitement to violence. Um, so there, there, there's, simply no excuse. I'm forgetting if I've answered your question, Professor, but. That's okay, because it's, it's so big. You know, that, that's the problem. It's just so much. Um, so let's talk about the phone calls made. Oh, that state I legislatures, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Raffensperger was one of the ones that I had the opportunity to examine. And I want to tell you the reaction in the room, uh, because, you know, we, we had powerful video, powerful audio, that when you think about it, Maybe many of the senators, and they said this to us, had not seen, uh, had not been totally aware of. They're, they're running busy lives and they're in hearing after hearing. They're not watching um, you know, CNN or PBS all day long. And, and so let's take a look at the particular phone call to Secretary of State Raffensperger, Republican Secretary of State Ra Raffensperger in Georgia, where the president over and over and over again pressured. And he said, uh, I, I just... I just find me uh, 11,000, I think it was 280 votes, or maybe it was 780 votes, um, because he had lost by 11,779 votes. The transparency of that, I was speaking at that time, the lawyer in the team that's sitting at the dais next to me as I came back, and I heard sort of a gasp among some of the senators. And Literally, she handed me a note and she said, I, I saw two senators say, I can't believe that. He's going to go to jail for that. It, it was so obvious. Find me the, the exact number of votes plus one and you will have done your job. He threatened them. So what, we, what I also wanted to tell was the story of people doing their job against the powerful threats and intimidation of the former guy. Uh, and, and Raffensperger stood up. His family faced death threats. He stood up and he did his job and he was undeterred. And he said in an op-ed, you saw, he, he wrote, I supported this president. I voted for this president. I contributed to this president. And he threw me and my family under the bus. And I think what our listeners have to understand, which they may not, is the incredible power just of the office of the president. Yeah. Um, having, no matter who that person is, having a president call you on the phone, the person who has the power of the attorney general's office, the, the power of millions of tweet followers and so forth, calling you, that's a heady thing. Um, inviting you to the White House. He invited state legislators from Pennsylvania to the White House to see if he couldn't convince them to change their minds on the certification of electors. That's a, that's a powerful pressure, heady and powerful, especially if he's the president of your party too. You wanna believe him. Um, the same thing happened in Michigan. The same thing happened in Pennsylvania that happened in Georgia. The pressure on the state legislator 
to find or change the results of the election? As, was that part of the evidence you put in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, imagine there were court cases in Pennsylvania, um, one that I quoted, I wish I had it in front of me right now, it was very beautifully um, uh, uh, ruled upon uh, by the judge, um, but showed that even the, the argument about disenfranchising even a single vote was unacceptable. But the argument that the Trump campaign or representatives for Trump uh, and, and others were putting forward was an argument to disenfranchise millions of Pennsylvania voters. Uh, so that on its face is so grotesquely wrong and the judge wasn't willing to do it in the absence of any proof. Uh, you heard the president's attorney, uh, Mr. Giuliani, when asked, are you presenting evidence of fraud in this election? He said, no, we don't have it. They had to stipulate that they didn't have evidence of fraud. But the, the judge's point, and, and it was case after case after case, state after state, was you're asking me to disenfranchise a single voter or you're asking me to disenfranchise tens of thousands or millions of voters. Uh, it's the most un-American thing that a judge could do and I'm not going to do it. Um, and, and the other thing I think about it, Professor, it, somebody answered this for me, the illogical nature of it. If they think the ballot was improperly cast for the president, what do you do about the Republican congressman who won as a result of that same ballot? Because we're all on the same ballot, folks. So are we tossing them and their election results out? It was madness, political desperation. If I may add as well, his other attorney just admitted that there are that no reasonable person would believe the argument they were making in court. That's no. uh, so it seems such an over oh, you an attorney, you're an attorney, I was a trial attorney. Uh, Bruce is an attorney. We're all attorneys here. I, you know I how case covering attorney. <laughs> okay. Whatever. But here's a case of overwhelming evidence. No real defense at all is put on. And yeah. yet, 43 senators vote no. Do you have an explanation? And I want your reaction to that. You know, we were in a press blackout while we were preparing for the trial and in the trial. Self-imposed. We decided we didn't want to be distracted. But that was the question. That was the question. Uh, immediately. Did you fail to put forward the right evidence? Did you, was there something you were missing? Uh, if only you had done this or called this person or that. And I, I thought immediately, we didn't lack for evidence. We had too much evidence, if anything. We didn't lack for the law or the constitution or the wisdom of our founders and framers. We lacked people with a conscience. Uh, we lacked 43 people with a conscience. They know right from wrong. They're the highest elected officials in our nation. If they don't love our constitution and believe in the importance of keeping a, a check on a president so that the president does not become a dictator or a king, uh, an autocrat, what are they there for? So in essence, I'm meandering to say, I cannot for the life of me, I can't understand how those 43, they have to recognize that's gotta be one of the most important, if not the most important vote they will ever cast. And they got that so very wrong. But maybe you professors have a better answer for me from a, a, a different- I have, thought. I have a thought. Now, don't forget now, um, many of these senators claimed that it was, this was an unconstitutional proceeding. Right, he's out of office. This is beyond his um, his tenure, and you can't impeach a non-incumbent president. Now, that's a very interesting argument. However, as we all know from the Constitution, the, the Senate is the final arbiter of how they are to conduct an an impeachment trial, and the Senate voted that indeed it was not unconstitutional. 
That right. is to say, right. the, the, the former guy could be tried and convicted. Nevertheless, a series of these senators said, I'm not voting to convict because it's unconstitutional. Well, what's your thinking about that? They literally voted against their own ruling. What kind of precedent does that set? Um, they had to take a, a, a vote early on to decide whether or not it was constitutional to, to hold this trial and convict based on the fact that he was no longer in office. Now, let's remember, legally, constitutionally, and by case law, he committed these acts while in office. So, of course, you, you'd have to have the teeth to be able to say what you did in office matters, regardless of when we get to try you. Uh, and, and also, you, you might remember something. Um, we wanted to deliver the article of impeachment while the president was still in office. Literally, it's a very simple ceremonial. I remember sitting in the speaker's offices uh, debating it. We said, when can we deliver? When can we deliver? Uh, Mitch McConnell refused to receive the article. You can't just leave it with a clerk. He refused to receive it while the president was still in office barring us from doing the very thing that they would then argue, well, sorry, he's out of office now. Uh, you, can't, you can't convict him now. So it was wrong constitutionally. It was wrong procedurally because they blocked it. Uh, it was wrong by way of case law in terms of other impeachments of judges, for example, uh, who had been out of office, who tried to say, I'll resign from office rather than you have an impeachment trial about me. Um, and then by the Senate's own vote, uh, the procedural rule was this is a constitutional process. And yet they voted against, they said not guilty against their own precedent and hung their hat on that false argument. You know, the opening um, prayer by the chaplain at the impeachment, it was beautiful and very simple. And it was based on truth. That's what we were lacking, people who really prized the truth so that they could hang their hat on, oh, sorry, I wish I could do better, but it's not constitutional to deal with this now that he is out of office. Uh, and yet, as you saw, Mitch McConnell, within minutes of saying not guilty, stood and said he is morally and practically responsible. This was a dereliction of duty. When I heard Mitch McConnell say that, we were huddled back in our war room where we were working and somebody said, turn that up. We turn up the TV and hear him stand in the very same place with a prepared speech, uh, damning the president's behavior and calling him responsible. And I thought when he said um, a dereliction of duty, I wondered if he wasn't speaking also about himself. Because he voted no. He stood, I went back into the chamber to watch the vote. He stood in his space and said, not guilty sat down and literally within, it had to be within 20 minutes to a half hour, stood in that space with his prepared page after page speech, condemning the actions of the president and calling him responsible. <sighs> yeah, I need a deep breath. I really do. Um, I thought I was living in a different universe. I really, when I heard that, I thought, it can't be the onion because I actually see him speaking. So it can't be satire, but yeah. Yeah. I think this is a good point. If we have questions, if anyone would like to ask a question or Bruce, obviously if you have additional questions and, and if you want to ask questions, please chat them. So, cause there's a lot of people here and I can ask them. Go ahead, Bruce. Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, I, I'm, Listen, I think uh, I spent some time um, recently going over the YouTube uh, of Madeline Dean in her presentation, and I'm just overwhelmingly um, impressed uh, by how uh, by how it came out. I mean, your your presentation was 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 superb. Um, I don't get it either. Um, spineless has the, the term spi words spineless has crossed my mind. Um, but, you know, this is uh, politics and some people are concerned about their constituency, regardless of what his, the what history books are going to be saying about them. Yeah. Congressman, um, 
I, I teach students and I teach them about constitutional law and I teach them about our government. Um, how am I supposed to teach them that we have a, um, a fair and just system when somebody like you makes an amazing case based on an incredible amount of evidence and puts it out there in a clear and concise way and it's still ignored uh, by 43 senators. I mean, how, how do I teach that to my students? Well, um, I don't know. I, I am a glass half full kind of a gal. And, and so I remember when we huddled back right after the verdict, Jamie Raskin, who I, I can't say enough. If you have uh, any time, just replay his arguments. Um, and what he was dealing with in his own life, how he came forward uh, in this role. And Nancy Pelosi, when she appointed him, said, uh, the times have found us and the times have found Jamie Raskin. Um, I believe that for all of history, you know, we're, we're caught in this trap of a moment where we've just lived through the last four years uh, of un incredible indecency uh, and, and um, deceit uh, and failure of transparency, uh, bigotry, the fomenting of bigotry, misogyny, you name it. So we are, we're traumatized, frankly, I'm sorry to say, I believe. Uh, what we were able to do in the impeachment trial, I hope, is to put down for all of history what we knew at that moment. And I think it, we're gonna learn so much more, but it clearly spells uh, the, the depths and descent of this presidency uh, and um, um, the, the, the amoral nature of the man, uh, that he never ever cared one whit for an injured person there, uh, worried about any of us. So I think what you teach your students is we've been through horrible, difficult, uh, fabric tearing times before. Uh, and what we have to do is continue to be engaged and be educated what, you, what you're doing about our civic responsibilities, about our constitution, about the gorgeous, precious nature of it, about the imperfection of it. Uh, and so uh, pay attention, elections matter. Vote these people out of office, hold them accountable for this disgraceful sets of behaviors uh, of misleading the American people, of lying to us. Uh, I, I, I really, and, and think of where we are today, we changed the Senate. The very same day of the insurrection was the Georgia vote. It, you couldn't write this script. Uh, what a difference that election made. Uh, no wonder the president was quite upset. Uh, the former guy, I should say. I have a really good question from Michael H. Mike, you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Um, I said, since a lot of Congress people participated in spreading election lies and misinformation, is there any way to hold them accountable as well? Michael, thank you for that question. And it's something I'm grappling with. I, I really want to try to be bi bipartisan. So in my first um, um, term in Congress, I got a single bill. I had some amendments put onto uh, different bills, but I got a single bill uh, signed into law by the former guy. Uh, and it was a bill that I co-sponsored with a Republican, uh, also a freshman, Guy Rushenthaler from the Western part of Pennsylvania. I wanted to do that. I wanted to try to find some common area of interest. Uh, and we did, we got past the Stoic Act, ironically signed, uh, July 25th of 2019, which is actually the day of the famous phone call of the president, uh, impeachment one. But we got a bill signed uh, and a bill that's worthy. Uh, Stoic has to do with um, um, the high rate, sadly, of suicide among law enforcement, uh, among police officers. So this is grants to police departments for best practices for themselves, for their family regarding PTSD to try to tamp down on the high rate of suicide. Suicide is greater than line of duty deaths for police officers. I got that passed with a freshman Republican 
who serves on judiciary with me, and we see eye to eye on almost nothing. But to your question, Michael, what do you do after an insurrection? When we came back to the floor at two in the morning or 1.30, two o'clock in the morning uh, on January the 7th, and had to vote whether or not to certify the electors, those who voted against certification of electors when they knew that it was unjust and unfounded, I, I literally sat with my staff and said, by Zoom, by the way, and said, uh, we have to make some decisions. I will not, this is my personal decision. I don't, I don't know what others are trying to do. But I said, I will not lift up legislation in a co-sponsorship way with someone who voted for insurrection. Uh, and, and literally it got me in trouble with somebody on a bill I care very much about that has to do with addiction. Uh, a gentleman on the other side of the aisle and I explained to him, I said, I want your support for the bill. Uh, I hope you will back it. But have you reflected at all upon your vote? You voted against democracy. You voted in favor of those who attacked us, who killed people here in this building, who damaged, who defecated, who broke things, who terrorized people. Uh, I said, if you reflect, I'd love to be co-partner with you on that. But the place I've chosen is I, I want to be bipartisan. I want to find bridges and places of commonality, but we have to see some reflection from those who voted against certification of election in favor of the big lie following an insurrection where they were victims. Uh, Congresswoman, I have one more question because we have an hour of your time. We can go on four hours on this, but um, from Terrell uh, Butts, one of my students, Terrell, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? I'll ask the question for if she can't get to it. She says, how do you think this is going to affect the way other countries view us? The insurrection. Really great question. Uh, you saw right away. Thank you, Terrell, for that question. And that's a really important thing to think about. I bet all of us thought about that throughout uh, the tenure of the last administration. Uh, I worried about our relationships around the world, first as a state representative, but then as a member of Congress and the deterioration, tearing down of our credibility around the world, breaking agreements, pulling out of agreements, not basing anything on the truth, um, lifting up foes, uh, disrespecting allies. Um, but that day, I think it was really heartwarming um, that other leaders, other uh, countries' leaders came to us and to our defense and argued for us. Uh, I, I remember um, um, the leaders of France and Canada in particular saying how much they, they admire American democracy uh, and were so scared and worried for us and stood by us. Uh, so um, maybe in a terrible way, it was a way to renew our relationships with other world leaders because they could empathize with the attack that we had been under. And, and fortunately, we made a change in this election, a decisive change, not to reelect the person who didn't give a damn about our democracy. Um, so I, I see us on a path to rebuilding relationships and rebuilding our credibility around the world. We have the, the power and the ability to be uh, a global leader, it's also obviously a very serious responsibility, um, but I see it as that horrible dark day as a pivot point for other leaders to come back to us. I wanna thank you so much for an incredible hour. This was riveting, it was informing, um, and it made me feel a little better <laughs> after feeling that day, my, my body shook that day. And thank you so much, uh, Bruce, for bringing her, the Congresswoman, to us. Thank you so much for that. It's been well, my she's, you know, she's spoken. She's spoken in, in one of my classes. So if you take my class, you might, you might hear her again. <laughs> invite, <laughs> invite me back. And I'm, the, I'm a former professor, so I'd rather hear from all of you. So next time, I'm, I'm going to sit there and take notes. All Thanks right, sure. we can do that. We can do that. Right. Thank you, Professors Lane and Haynes. Uh, thank and you Mike, so much. Thank you very much. And so nice to see so many friends up here. Good night. Good night.
Good night.